1930's All Quiet on the Western Front is considered one of the earliest examples of an anti-war film. It follows a group of German schoolboys through the First World War, from enlisting, to boot camp, and eventually fighting in the trenches, and it's known for its stark, unflinching look at the horror and brutality of warfare. But it begs the question, can any movie truly be anti-war? Hello and welcome to 100 Years of Cinema. We'll be taking a look at at least one film each year from 1915 onwards to track the evolution of film over the last century. War has been the topic of films for almost as long as the camera's been around. What's often cited as the first war film came out in 1898, and since then there have been films made about almost every major military conflict in modern history. And the reason is simple. War is dramatic. War gives filmmakers a backdrop where the stakes can be raised in an instant, where every emotion is heightened to its apex and acts of great valour, or cowardice, or betrayal, or friendship aren't just commonplace, they're expected. Two quotes are often brought up when talking about war films. There is no such thing as an anti-war film is famously attributed to filmmaker Francois Truffaut, who more precisely said in a 1973 issue of the Chicago Tribune, some films claim to be anti-war, but I don't think I've ever really seen an anti-war film. Every film about war ends up being pro-war. The second is from Steven Spielberg talking about Saving Private Ryan, who said, of course, every war movie, good or bad, is an anti-war movie. But the morality of war is a nuanced thing, and so too is the morality of the war movie. The truth is that most films will lie somewhere on a spectrum ranging from pro to anti-war. But what separates these two extremes? Let's first take a look at one of the films that falls pretty squarely at the pro-war end of the spectrum, The Green Berets starring John Wayne from 1968. The film was made in response to a growing anti-Vietnam War sentiment, with full cooperation of the US military who had approved the script before the film went into production. The Green Berets presents a war of black and white. The US military are shown as brave, kind soldiers who put themselves in harm's way to help treat injured children whereas this is how the enemy is described. They didn't kill the chief. They tied him to a tree, brought his teenage daughters out in front of him, and disemboweled them. Then 40 of them abused his wife. Of course, we never actually meet the Viet Cong in the film. They serve as a faceless horde for our heroes to fight against. It's a film that uncritically celebrates the righteousness of the American military in Vietnam. This is a Green Beret responding to a journalist who questions America's involvement in the conflict. Let me put it in terms we all can understand. If this same thing happened here in the United States, every mayor in every city would be murdered. Every teacher that you've ever known would be tortured and killed. So when something like this happens, we can celebrate. It ultimately portrays conflict as essential and purposeful, death as sacrificial and noble, and the leadership of the American military as benevolent hands guiding the world to a safer, more peaceful place. It focuses on actions and events rather than their emotional fallout, and this has the effect of glorifying the images of war without having to deal with their aftermath. But even a film as jingoistic as the Green Berets can never be completely pro-war. In an attempt to make a war film realistic, you have to include some casualty and death. If the heroes make it through the film without taking any damage, you risk making the fight look like a one-sided massacre. But by showing the death of one of your main characters, you show war for what it is, a violent and unkind place. Unsurprisingly, anti-war films tend to do the opposite. Professor of Philosophy at California State University, Dennis Rothermill, has written extensively about Hollywood's depiction of war. In an essay called Anti-War War Films, he writes about All Quiet on the Western Front and its presentation of warfare. He writes that anti-war movies tend to be more experiential, focusing on the reactions of the soldiers rather than the events of any one battle. Take a look at this scene in which the soldiers are trapped in a bunker during a bombardment. Rather than focusing on the explosions themselves, director Lewis Milestones puts his attention solely on the people, in a claustrophobic and tense scene, showing that war doesn't just result in physical violence, but also emotional and psychological. In another scene, Milestone highlights the random victimization as a result of war. 
Unlike the Green Berets, where only the Viet Cong are shown taking major casualties, All Quiet on the Western Front shows that in a war, violence is indiscriminate, and the politics of the country you're fighting for, or your personal morality, can't keep you safe. This is highlighted when Paul, the hero of the film, is shot dead reaching out of the trench for a butterfly. A key element of the anti-war film is the humanisation of all people involved. This is a theme that emerges twice in the film. The setup when the soldiers try to work out why they're fighting. Maybe it was the English. No, I don't want to shoot any Englishman. I never saw one till I came up here. And I suppose most of them never saw a German till they came up here. Oh, I'm sure they weren't asked about it. And the payoff when Paul, trapped in a crater, is forced to kill a retreating French soldier. Why should they send us out to fight each other? If we threw away these rifles and these uniforms, you could be my brother, just like Cat and Albert. Now, having to spend the night face to face with his enemy, Paul is filled with regret. Both the characters and the audience are confronted with the horror of war and the cost of humanity on both sides of the battle. Throughout the film, the leadership of the war are shown as cruel, incompetent, Why is it there a doctor here? or indifferent. But for a number of reasons, the film can't help but present war in a more positive light. Throughout the film, Paul develops good, meaningful relationships that have been forged through war. The film plays on the camaraderie of the soldier as something to be idealised, perhaps more meaningful than civilian relationships for having gone through war together. As a natural product of story structure, Paul emerges at the other end of the film having undergone personal growth. He returns to civilian life with a new perspective, one that those who have never been to war are unable to understand. The young men thought I was a coward because I told them that we learned that death is stronger than duty one's country. And even if that new understanding is that war is terrible, war was necessary in having achieved it. Part of the difficulty in making a film entirely pro or anti-war is that it's impossible to relate the true experience of war through the lens of cinema. And as a filmmaker, you can try to imbibe the film with any political message you want, but the final interpretation will always lie with the audience. As Dennis Rothermill points out, in a militarised culture, a certain percentage of the population will find any depiction of war romantic and engaging, regardless of the filmmaker's intention. The simple choice to make a film about war can lead to it being ennobled in people's minds. Inevitably, some people will find a kind of beauty in anti-war films like Platoon, or terror in more pro-war films like Black Hawk Down. In the end, it largely depends on your perception of war before you see the film. Most films will fall somewhere in between the two extremes, but where you place them on the spectrum might say more about you than it does the morality of war. Thanks for watching 100 Years of Cinema, my name's Charlie. What do you think? Can a film ever truly be completely pro or anti-war? If you're in the military, how do you feel when you see depictions of war on screen? I want to say a massive thank you to all my Patreon supporters. It really does make a huge difference. We're heading into the 1930s now, which is one of my favourite decades in all of cinema, and there are some truly groundbreaking films. So if you want to help me make the best videos I possibly can, you'll find a link to support me in the information box below. A donation of as small as a dollar will really go a long way in helping me get some new equipment, as well as getting a dedicated website for these videos. Also, in the information box below, you'll find a link to the anti-war film essay that I reference in this video. It's really interesting and it's definitely worth a read. So thank you for watching, please subscribe, you'll find links to more videos over here, and stay tuned for next time, which will be the first of two videos about films in 1931.